Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Explorations. Uh, back with a new camera to revisit some old ideas. There were a couple of things I'd mentioned in episode two that I, I sort of breezed over one point and found some references for another. So circling back, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I'd addressed Sam Vaknin speaking about how healing through intimacy is one of the most powerful routes available to us and how I was mystified by this. Um, sometime later, and now I do understand why it's so hard to find the material I'm looking for, because so many of these episodes, so many of these podcasts have to use really clickbait titles and so you can't really look necessarily by what's mixed into these very long format conversations that are then meant to catch your attention with things like red flag this and how you know they're the one and these types of things. Um, but Esther Perel was on, oh shoot, who was she on with? I think it was on Impact Theory. I have it here. Oh no, sorry. She was on with Lewis House on School of Greatness, and she was talking along very similar lines um, in terms of what Sam Vaknin had said, which is that you've ultimately got to show up to a relationship prepared to see yourself through the eyes of another, basically, and through that process to, to really come to understand yourself and become more of who you are through the process. The other voice on this one was Stéphane Labossier, who was saying that you really need to be healed to be in a relationship. And I, I think they're both right, in a way, because Stéphane Labossier's bread and butter is as a dating coach. And so he's trying to get people coupled up for long-term relationships, ultimately aiming toward marriage. And when you're talking about dating, if you're going out there completely emotionally unintelligent, unaware of what your issues are, oblivious to your own quirks and shortcomings, it's going to be a mess. Um, you do need to be on a certain level to be with another human being. But <clears throat> Sam Vaknin's talking about our own personal growth and what we can gain from that experience. The, the goal there is through the mess of it to, to clean up our rough edges ultimately. And I apologize, I have this phone on a tripod, on a, on a surface, on a bed that I'm sitting on. And so as I move, it moves. So I'll try to keep it steady. Um, yeah, already getting distracted. <laughs> All right, focus, we can do this. Um, this is how I talk to myself all day. I pep talk myself through so much stuff, especially when I'm camera shy. You know, what's funny about this is that I've spent a lot of time practicing and yet the minute I'm aware that I'm talking to an audience, the old camera shyness comes back. Okay. So to pick up what I was saying, I'd, I'd become fascinated with what Sam Vaknin said about how this is really the best way to heal. He, he said that there's no therapy better than this. And then out the other side, I'm listening to Stefan Lavoisier saying that, you know, you have to be healed to be in a relationship. And this sounds contradictory, but I think what I, I was able to tease out was that they have different objectives. One is for the individual within the relationship to, to learn and grow and heal and self-actualize. And the other was for two people to come together and have a functional relationship that can be sustainable and, and you know, hopefully produce a marriage that is also sustainable and ultimately sane and nourishing and <laughs> lovely. Uh, a lot of marriages are sustainable, but they're rather unbearable for the participants. So these are different objectives. So I don't think either one is wrong, but I could not find any further information on what 
Sam Vaknin had said on the subject until listening to uh, Esther Perel on School of Greatness with Lewis House, she said almost the same thing uh, in her own lovely and inimitable way. And since I can't imitate, it, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm not going to try to imitate. Uh, I took notes because that's what I do. And she said, a relationship is not about this person and that person. The relationship is what happens in between. It's the dynamic. Um, she says, we are not the same person with different partners. The relationship is a figure eight. It's what I do that makes you do something that then makes you... Hmm? I did this wrong. It's what I do that makes you do something then that makes you react a certain way that draws that out of me, that draws that out of you, and each one actually creates the other. We got through it. So she also supported the idea that you don't need to be healed to be in a relationship to achieve greater self-knowledge and self-mastery. Um, she said it was through the process of... <clears throat> excuse me. Through the process... See, every time I get nervous, my throat tightens up and I start coughing. It's perfect. <sighs> okay. It's through this process of reflecting back to one another and responding to what's reflected back that we, we see how we are perceived and experienced by our partner. And that either aligns or conflicts with our own concept. And if it aligns, it's supportive. And you say, okay, good, I'm on track. And if it conflicts well, we might conflict, then there may be dispute or argument or fights, we don't know, but there's there's a point of contention arises that needs to be resolved within the individuals and the couple. And in that process, that's the learning, that's the growing, that's what allows for us to, to recognize where we do need to heal and where we do have gifts. And to to just get a better read on ourselves because I've had a lot of experience lately walking around thinking I know me and then being very surprised at maybe I'm not so far off from what I think approximately the broad strokes are fine that's pretty well aligned but when I sit down to write or reason through something I'm surprised by how basically sloppy the thinking is until I start structuring it on the page or I type it into a a document and I see that yeah you really need that feedback loop it's it's the way biofeedback works but it's it's psycho feedback <laughs> who are you calling a psycho anyway <laughs> the lady who talks to herself all day to get through the day um yeah I found that really um helpful to, to hear it through her perspective that yeah, it is the process of sort of making each other through this experience. And, um, yeah, it, it, she said a lot. I have, I have pages. It was an amazing discussion. If you get a chance, do check out Esther Perel on School of Greatness with Lewis Howes. I'll see if I can put something below for that. But, um, I'd kind of left off saying I wish I could get more insight into this. And then... The first bit of insight was hearing what seemed to be a contradictory assertion that you have to be healed to be in a relationship, as per Stefan Le Bossier, um, which I don't think is ultimately contradictory. Again, I think we're, we're working with different objectives. Um, but to hear another person who, who certainly, Esther Perel, has years of experience as a relationship counselor. She's published, she speaks, she's she's involved in her work very deeply and passionately. In fact, she talks a lot about um, eroticism as, as more of a life drive, more like what Freud meant by libido. It's not actually just a sex drive, it's a life drive. It's that that urge. And she tells a beautiful story about her family. Her parents were apparently both sole survivors of the Nazi concentration camps, and they had met in a, in 
the the refugee camp for the survivors and she and her brother are the product of that and she said that her parents described it as though there were two camps in one and there was the group that after having been through that trauma had stayed real low to the ground were real protective and self-protective and, and stayed kind of low and there was the other group that got up and got busy living and her parents were among those. They they got married, they had children, life went on. And I think that's so much of what we're all we're all here to do, to, to figure out how we pick up the pieces and carry on and, and it's like in music. If you, you screw up and you miss a beat or you hit the wrong note, you try to hit the next one and the next one, the next one, you fall in on it as fast as you can. There's no going back, there's no undoing the mistake but what you can do is you can hit the next one right and that's that's what her her parents had done as as so many people there had in contrast with other people who just never were able to really move past it the music kind of stopped for them and and there's something tragic about that and so when she's talking about things being erotic she's talking about that life force that drove her family to to become a family and produced her said she can talk to us about this and yeah that's that's a lot of her stuff is about being in that erotic energy in life just just being with it and and she seems to embody it she's she's quite a lady so definitely wanted to get back and mention that I had actually come on come upon more resources and I was I was encouraged to see someone else who's whose insight and experience I respect and, and value, saying something the same, that we, we can't wait to be perfected to, to have relationships. And I'm still not clear on what Sam Vaknin meant when he said um, it needs to be um, intimate. I don't know if that means a, a sexual and romantic partnership or it could apply to friends, coworkers, neighbors, family, whoever's handy, that you have a more intimate connection with. And I'm inclined to think it's the latter. Since that question came up for me, I've been observing in my own life, and I've found that almost anyone can offer valuable feedback if you're alert to it and receptive to it. And I find it to be a tremendously powerful tool in my how do I put it? It's not quite the healing part of it. It's the restructuring part of it. Coming out the other side of my own difficulties, feeling disoriented and cut off and having to kind of start from, from square one in, in a process of rejoining the world, I wasn't sure what I was walking myself into. And it's it's been the aggregate of all the responses, all the feedback I get that have really helped me to get a better picture of how most people most of the time experience me. And that gives me a better picture of what I'd like to cultivate and what I'd like to prune <laughs> and where I, I really want to carry those aspects and attributes. And so I think that it's true that we do become who we are through each other, and that's a way in which we can serve each other. I, I saw today a quote from Ram Das that said, something to the effect of all you can do for me is to work on you, and all I can do for you is to work on me. And I think there's one more piece of that, which is, and if we do it together, we'll be so much more effective in that work and we'll be able to guide and support and, um, I want to say antagonize. I don't mean maliciously for fun. I mean to act as antagonists, to be that, that force that does draw something out of, of the other. Um, just as we need someone to draw things out of us, that's... Um, I believe Matthew Hussey said something about that, that he said, these are key things you're looking for in a partnership, is that you could be, I love he talks about being teammates, and I think that's really valuable, is you have to realize you're on the same team, you can't compete, you can't play against each other, um, and you need to know your positions on the field and be working from the same playbook. 
Um, but he'd also said something about a good relationship being with someone who draws good things out of you and allows you the chance to draw what's good out of them. And maybe it wasn't good. It was, I, I'm going to put it in terms of draw what's a benefit, right? I think that's the key that I'm, I'm zeroing in on. Was what's the benefit of putting ourselves through all of this um, in terms of the amount of energy, attention, risk we is that is required for us to even undertake a, a an intimate relationship with people, and I've also thought about the the way we think of intimacy. Intimacy is more related to vulnerability than it is to sexuality. We use the word intimacy as a euphemism for sexuality, but I think it's it's a much broader word that applies to any time that we can get in close with people and be real. And that could be a stranger waiting for the bus with us. We could get real deep. I find sometimes strangers are much more open to share and to hear things than the people in our lives because there's not much investment. If a stranger judges you, you part ways, you never see each other again, your secret goes that way. It just, it's gone, it's forgotten, and so I find often strangers will open up to me about very personal things that they probably don't say to their intimate partners, right? The romantic partners. Um, and yeah, that intimacy can be achieved at many levels with many people. So I don't know how to frame it because I have a little bit of a problem with romance, like in the, the way of our notions that are more like rom-coms than real life. And saying intimacy, I think that's a broader word than the way in which we use it. Um, so I don't know how to describe um, these partnerships, these, these dyads, right? Or triads or whatever. It's brave new world. Um, <laughs> that's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, but polyamory seems to be on vogue at the moment. So we want to, we don't want to make the, the throuples feel left out. Anyway, before I digress too far, I, uh, I wanted to go back to that because I'm still fascinated by this idea of what does it require of us to show up to another person? person and say, hi, I'd like to try and do this thing with you, whatever that is, whatever the relationship might be, particularly if it's romantic or sexual. Yeah, it's a lot more charged. That's where we're not always the same people, right? I mean, the closer you get, the more of your deep dark kind of is drawn to the surface. That's part of what we draw out of each other is the Jungian shadow, that that rejected and denied aspect of us and it it makes sense because the idea of doing what we now call shadow work is to acknowledge and integrate those aspects of ourselves that we don't project them or suppress them in a way that they come out perverted and mutated and sideways through other channels um and this is sort of a continuation of that discussion. It's like, let your partner come in close, activate your, your shadow aspects, see that come up, and then between you, have a chance to work that out and integrate it towards growth, healing, self-actualization, and, and this ability to go into the world and carry out what you really have inside of you. Because on a, a next level, that's of great interest to me. I think that we squander human resources at an alarming rate. I think there's, most people have a lot more in them than they have access to. And that means that they're in no position to bring it out and to share it with others. Like me and my camera shyness and my difficulty breathing when I'm doing this. We're going to keep going. We're going to power through. We don't care. We're doing this. More pep talks. All right. So that was one of the points, and that ties in reasonably well with the other point, which is I had been talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and showing my little drawings with circles and pyramids and whatnot. 
and um, going through it, I had remarked at the base of the pyramid stuff like food, shelter, um, what were some of the other essential things you have to have, safety, um, but also sexuality was there. And I thought, that's interesting. I remarked, I said, hmm, that's interesting. And then later I thought, well, why is that interesting? And it was really some part of my mind was playing which one of these doesn't belong. Because when you look at it, the others are immediate individual survival needs. You don't eat, you don't get water, you don't have shelter from the elements. Game over. You get a few days like that and then you're done for. Sex, that's not true on the individual level. You are not going to die if you don't have sex for so many days, weeks, months, or years. Um, some people have gone their entire life absolutely celibate, had no ill effects. Um, now, I'm not recommending that. I do think sex has tremendous benefit on numerous levels, and so <laughs> I'm not encouraging people to, to take up lifelong celibacy, but to acknowledge that that is possible and to say, look, it's not a real need in the same way. So I was wondering, why is it at the base? And I thought, ah, it's, it's basically, there's a way of putting it that you could say that reproduction is the meaning of life. When you take away everything else, our ability to transmit our genetic code to the next generation and to keep our lineage in the gene pool, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's the name of the game. That's the reason we do all the other things. We grow to maturation and, you know, we need food and shelter and all these other things to get us there that we can become sexually mature and actually reproduce and pass on our lineage. And um, for the species, it's a major drive. It's, it's, it's the whole ball of wax from a certain perspective. And so, yeah, it's going to, it's going to manifest at the base of the pyramid that, that represents the hierarchy of needs. And I just, I found it really intriguing that it's jumbled in there without a note. I guess that's what it is. Even though it's not like the others, I think maybe it is in the right place. It's foundational. It's It underlies so many of the other drives and, and influences them. Our need for connection comes from the fact that we need to be with others to reproduce and provide for and protect our young. So it, it is an underlying force. And speaking of young, it, it leads to another point that's been of great interest to me lately. Now we've, we've circled back, we've hit a couple of the points that I wanted to revisit. So going forward, one of the thoughts I'm exploring right now is what is the impact on these pair relationships that is romantic relation, we're just going to call them romantic. Um, what is the impact on romantic relationships when you subtract that piece from the equation, when you subtract reproduction as a primary drive and objective within the relationship, because ever more people are, I don't want to say choosing not to have children, it does, it does seem that most people who have not had children, at least I think it was 80% of women who did not have children before their fertility window closed, had not intended to, uh, remain childless. There were about 10% who had elected it and about 10% for whom there were substantial fertility issues. And for the, the other 80% who did not actually have family, they didn't, they didn't mean to end up there. It's just the way it worked out. So I got to be careful not to say chose not to have family, but for, for a variety of reasons, people are living their lives without that as a, a an objective and a drive in some cases some people just don't have the drive for it um and so what impact does it have for them just traveling the whole line that way and then i thought about people who've had family but they break up or divorce or 
or widowed or whatever the case may be, they find themselves now that they've, they have married or partnered up and they have had children and now they are without a partner. And if the children are grown or otherwise provided for and not a major factor, how does that impact those individuals along that part of the line? There are people for whom it's one continuous line and there are people for whom there's been a, a partnership and a, a chapter of children and now they've shifted and if they're looking for new partnership what does that look like what are the what are the drives and objectives there how is it is how is it the same and how does it differ i don't have any answers yet but this has led me out to this has contributed to me asking the question of of what influence that bears listening to conversations and having life experiences is probably the larger part of it but yeah i'm i'm looking at at that in conjunction with the the insight I had about Maslow's hierarchy and I said yeah that's interesting if that's one of those underlying things and it's either obstructed or withdrawn from the equation then what what does that do to not only our romantic partnerships but our our life drives how we orient how we perceive ourselves um, all these other factors that if it's if it's so foundational in this the psychological construct then all the things that sit on it it would seem would be impacted by a shift there so i would like to look into that further along with about a dozen other things i have pages of notes that i'm absolutely burning to bring forth and i am spread between many projects and many responsibilities at the moment so it's unfortunately been a little bit on a slow drip here but i'm trying to pick it up and i'm happy to get back and finally address these points that have been rattling around and taking shape for i guess it's been a few months now didn't mean to leave it off like that but again i'm i've got more interests and passions than time so i'm trying to rotate through the various points of focus <laughs> yeah it's hard it's hard to track all that sky so I'm uh, I'm looking ahead and thinking about that and so many other things that I would like to explore here and I really appreciate you guys coming along and taking the ride with me as always I, I appreciate your time and I hope that this is of some value all right, well, we'll see what the next installment brings. Until then, I thank you again, and I wish you all the best. Take care.